Battle of Jericho? Could be a question in a Sunday school quiz, couldn't it? Who fought the Battle of Jericho? Uh, the, the, the children who know the story well will say Joshua. Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. There's even a song, isn't there? Uh, an old fashioned song about it. Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. But actually, look closely at the account in Joshua chapter six and I think we'll see that Joshua didn't really fight anything at all. Here we go. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua didn't really fight the battle of Jericho, did he? God was the one who fought it. Joshua did practically nothing. God says at the start of this uh, reading, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. I've already done it, says the Lord. Uh, I'm in charge. Uh, I will win the battle. Uh, but uh, the Lord gives them an instruction which they are to follow. And it's the thing about uh, marching around the city uh, once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they march around it seven times blowing the trumpets, and then at the end of that, there's a big lang, lo, long blast on the trumpets, after which the whole army is to give a shout. Uh, some people have, uh, have seen in this a, a possible kind of naturalistic scientific explanation of how it might have happened. Maybe there was a, a massive acoustic shock wave set up by all those people shouting uh, and the trumpets blast all at the same time. A, a shock wave so big that it actually somehow um, uh, compromised the structure of the city walls of Jericho, which then fell down and uh, served no protection at all. And then the city was ransacked. But actually, whether it has a natural, whether it has a, a scientific explanation or not, is secondary. Because even if it does, it still says God the, his own work. The Lord has delivered the city into their hands. They have to do it in his particular way, but he's delivered it. They just need to take it. Now, what happens next in the story is very, very unpleasant reading for us as Christians, because we want to be on God's side in the story, don't we? But what happens is that the entire um, uh, population of the city of Jericho is put to the sword, except for Rahab and her family, those who were in her house with her, with the scarlet cord tied in the window. And we say, look, I feel very uncomfortable being on God's side in the story where men, women and children get killed uh, and and that's God's instruction that's what he tells them to do it's not that they get it wrong that's what God tells them to do I feel very uncomfortable about that now this is a massive topic I'm not going to explore or exhaust it in just a, a, a few minutes now but uh, the, the the point is we're getting two things here two big lessons here one is God is really serious about sin it's really serious about sin. Sin injures God so badly that death is the only uh, logical, only fair, the only um, uh, uh, just consequence of it. We're told that the Canaanite nations did not serve God. They followed their own gods and therefore their sin was very great. That's how God talks about it. And the punishment is death. Our sin is very significant. Our sin is very, very serious. The punishment for our sin is also death. It's the same God pronouncing the same punishment on sin. Uh, and, and we sometimes forget that, that God actually condemns each of us to death for our sin. And when Jesus died in our place, he took the punishment. He became, if you like, like an, inhab an, an inhabitant of Jericho. He became like you and me, punished for sin. But we've also been uh, 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 given that uh, great mercy through the death of Jesus in our place, just as Rahab was and her family in Jericho. See, not every single person was killed. Those who turned to the Lord 
were shown mercy. Uh, we're not told that Rahab was any less guilty than all the others, but she turned to the Lord at that last moment and was shown mercy. Uh, and that is the offer that we extend to all who will hear God's uh, story. The good news of Christ's love for us is that even though each of us deserves to be killed for our sin, instead Jesus died and we've been brought into God's people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we repent of our sin, which places a barrier between us and you. We're sorry that uh, every time we turn our backs on you or ignore you or forget you or just fail to think about you, we're cutting ourselves off from the source of life and therefore naturally placing ourselves in a, a place of death. We thank you that uh, this horrific story of the destruction of Jericho shows us how serious the consequences of our own sin would be. And that when Jesus died on the cross, it was uh, because the, uh, the terrible consequences of our sin had to be paid. And yet we thank you that because he suffered in our place, you've extended to us the amazing mercy as Rahab and her family experienced and therefore have brought us into a relationship with you. May we remember day by day all that Jesus did for us and may we put to death our own sin, knowing what it cost him. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Um, this is a very, very tough bit of theology, very tough bit of the Bible story. If you're uh, wanting to ask questions about it, follow up, drop me a line. It's absolutely fine. Um, otherwise, see you tomorrow. One, uh, one more session to go. God bless.